Okay. Buenos días. Vamos a tener esta reunión en dos idiomas. Si ustedes quieren escuchar la junta en español, por favor, vayan al símbolo del globo terráqueo y ahí pueden seleccionar el idioma de español, porque la junta va a ser en inglés. Um, okay, we're going to have uh, this meeting in English, but if you want to hear it in Spanish, please just go to the globe and select Spanish. If you don't want uh, to be recorded, please just turn off your camera and you are not going to be seen. Okay, and this is our committee. Daniela Velasco is our president. Uh, she's not here, unfortunately. Uh, but uh, here we are, I'm Brenda Veronica, I'm the co-vice president. Janina also is a co-vice president. And we have here Ashley Gates, our secretary. And now please uh, share with us what is in the name of your child, uh, the school and grade of your children, and what would you like to see happen for our English learners this year? Please uh, share in the chat uh, so we can know you and your kids. Um, so if I have a two I have a little one Okay. Um, who's not monitoring the chat? Do you want to tell us who's who we have with us and what we're seeing? So far, we have Juliana. She's a healer at the Mitchell. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, big turnout, but we're recording, so that's good. Okay. Um, and this is our agenda for today. For new information, uh, we're going to learn about being bilingual. It's a superpower, initially. Uh, the English learner progress and the ELAC reports from each school. And the follow-ups is uh, goals for uh, 2023 and 24 and progress made so far. So this is our agenda. And for the presentation for our agenda, we have uh, Miss Julie Kane. So she's going to go in <laughs> with this meeting. <laughs> Thank you, Brenda. Mm -hmm. Good morning. Buenos dias. Welcome to our meeting. Today, I want to share with you uh, a new initiative out of the Department of Education. This is the United States Department of Education called Being Bilingual is a Superpower. And as you can see on my screen, I have some superpower, superhero um, images uh, because they really are recognizing, maybe for the first time, how important and how uh, powerful it is to be able to speak and understand more than one language. So they have shared an enormous number of resources across the country to help uh, motivate more and more students to become bilingual and multilingual and to understand how important it is and how powerful it is to have those skills. And some of the things that they've shared in this initiative are the English Learner Family Toolkit. Those of you who are here in person, I gave you a copy of the English so far. I'm printing the English, the Spanish, and the Arabic version of this document. And I wanted to take a few minutes just to orient you to it. And we will share copies at each school site, as well as share the link with you so that you can look at it. And we can work on parts of it at each of our meetings. 
So I'm going to stop sharing for a second and shift so I can show you what this looks like. So if you can see my screen here, this is the English version. And for some reason, my friends here in the room, the front cover didn't print because it's very attractive front cover, but this is a toolkit for families. And what it offers is lots of information let me, about enrolling your child in school, attending school in the United States, how, how to access educational programs and services for your child, disability related services for your children, the health and safety of your child at school, and helping your child be successful in school. And every chapter has a link about your rights as a family and as a student, uh, as a parent of an English learner. So if we take a look, we'll just take a, a pass at chapter one, enrolling your child in school. For many of our new families coming from other countries, our enrollment process can be a little confusing. It's different. This document talks about how you enroll your, span, your student, what your rights are for enrolling your student in school. If you keep scrolling through, it gives you in every chapter suggested questions to ask school staff so that you can be informed who can help me enroll. It talks about the different ages, what documents do I need to provide? What information do I need to provide? Uh, yes. Um, we can't see what you're seeing. You can't see. What are you seeing? Um, the, uh, you're seeing my slides? Mm -hmm. Let me stop the share and see if it comes up again. Do you see it now? Thank you. My apologies. Um, as I was saying, each chapter has questions to ask school staff, your rights, and then tips for families. For instance, the number one uh, tip for families is here. It says, do not sign any paperwork until you understand the information. One of the documents we often have challenges with is the home language survey. Parents fill it out and sign it and don't always understand what it is they're filling out. So we spend, when I say we, I mean your eLERT at your site, your community liaison, spend time helping parents understand what it is and what it means. For those of us in the room, you filled out a home language survey before. It asks you four questions, trying to get at what is the language that your child is most comfortable using. Uh, it tries to identify if your child might need extra supports in learning English. And it triggers uh, the initial LPAC assessment to see the level of English that your child speaks, which then leads to, if your child's identified as an English learner, it leads to receiving English language development services, right? But many parents have heard rumors, I'm just gonna write English, 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 because I don't want my child identified as an English learner because that is bad, right? My child's going to be segregated. My child's not going to have services. That's not true. And we want parents to understand that this is an avenue for help because how do you learn science if you can't speak the language and understand the language of the class being taught? So um, it's really important that our parents understand um, so that we can give our kids the best possible resources. So I encourage you, again, I will be uh, sharing the 
English version, the Spanish version, kit de, herram kit de herramientas de para familias de aprendices de inglés, right? I will share the Arabic version because they do have that available now as well. Uh, so that at your sites, there will be a copy available as well as you can dig in at your ELAC meeting. You can start talking about what are where are the areas where we feel good? Where are the areas where we could use some more information or some more help? Uh, and hopefully that will lead to some good conversations at your school site. So I'm gonna stop there for a moment. Any questions about that so far? I'm looking in the room, I'm looking in the camera, forgive me, I'm, I'm looking everywhere. If you have questions, please put them in the chat. If you're in our viewing audience, if you're here, please don't be shy. I'm gonna stop sharing again so I can go back to the other, uh, to my slides I was sharing with you. Okay, are you transitioning with me? Do you see slides now? Okay, so this is what I just shared with you. Okay, the English Learner Family Toolkit or Kit de Herramientas para las Familias de Estudiantes de Inglés so that you will have a copy if the, if the printer serves me well today. Those of you who are in person, you'll walk out with all three copies and you can take it with you back to your site. If it doesn't, which is possible, <laughs> knowing how things work, I will send them home this week with your e-alerts or your community liaison. So there is at least one printed copy of each at your site. I will also give the links so that it's on hand for any parent who comes in to see. The second resource that uh, the Department of Education shared last week is this document, oops, this document, uh, which is a handbook for refugee parents. And it goes into great detail about United States schools for our families who are newcomers. And we'll talk a little bit more about newcomers as we go through our data in a minute. Um, but let me show you, I'm gonna try sharing again, a different document just so you can see. Hopefully you will, there it is. Okay, are you seeing my, are you seeing what I'm seeing? Okay, so this is a very large document, but it has everything from, if I can make this bigger. Calendar for schools, school procedures, the US school system, your rights and responsibilities, Questions like, what do children learn in kindergarten? It might be very different here than the, our experiences have been in other countries, right? What is middle school versus junior high school versus high school? Um, how did schools help my child learn English? That's a really big one for our group, right? And how do I make sure my school is doing that and that my child is receiving what they have a right to receive? It talks about the calendar. When do we go to school? When do we not go to school? What do children eat for lunch? This, this can be very different and very jarring for a student who comes from a completely different system. It goes through the emergency contact cards, how to get an interpreter, um, rules and discipline, parent participation, preparing for college. I mean, it is, as you can see, immense. It is high, many, many pages. But what is helpful for schools and helpful for parents is it has lots of visuals, lots of vocabulary, lots of support for parents. So again, this is a resource we'll have on site at every school. Our community liaisons, our English uh, language instructional resource teachers, our social workers all will have copies of this to help our families feel more comfortable and understood. The Department of Education has provided it so far in English, Spanish, and French. Uh, interestingly though, French can be very useful for some of our Arab Arabic speaking countries, for our Vietnamese speaking families. So it's a bridge 
I'm hoping they will offer more languages as time goes on, but we are amassing a large number of resources. So if you and all of our families, new and even those who've been with us for a while, understand how our schools work. So I was really happy to see that the Department of Education across the whole country is take, making an effort to make these um, resources available for our families. And I wanted you to have them. So you in the room, you got first dibs, but we will make sure that we have copies everywhere in all of our sites. I'll pause again. Questions, comments? Okay, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna unshare again. I'm going to go back to our slides. Okay, so those are the resources shared that I want to have available for you. The next thing I wanted to share with you is some information about our English learner progress. Uh, this is a section of a presentation that we did for the board at our um, the last board meeting. So the November, I forget the date, uh, board meeting that we had, 16th, I think. And to give you a sense of where we are with our English learner progress as a district. Again, when you go back to your sites, you're digging into your school data. Right now, I'm just showing you a picture of the whole district. So, as you all know, this year we started with iReady for the first time, and all of your children took the initial diagnostic in September. We are just about to start next week, the second assessment. So this is our baseline data. Next week, we're taking assessment number two. So in January, when we meet again, we'll have two data points and we can look for growth to see how did our kids do in September and how much have they improved by December. Our hope, and if, did any of you attend the iReady parent meeting last, yesterday? Practically the whole room. Awesome. Okay, so you learned a lot about those reports and what we can see and how there's the, um, I forget the regular goal and then the stretch goal, right? So we're looking at, did our kids meet those goals and how are they progressing, right? Okay, so. This is September, okay? As you can see, there are three tiers. Green is where we want all our kids to be. That's tier one, right? If we're doing our jobs effectively in the classroom, about 80, 85% of our children should be in the green, right? Yellow is tier two, kids who are at least a year behind in their skill set, right? And they need some extra support. And then tier three are our children who need a lot more support to make it to grade level. Now, specifically what I pulled out to share with you today is our English learners, because this is our English learner group, right? This, these are the kids that we want to think about. So as you can see here, our initial fluent English proficient students, and those are the children who fill out the home language survey and say, I speak a language in addition to English, and they're assessed and they come out fluent. I'm fluent in English and I'm fluent in my home language. They are performing very well on the September assessment. Our reclassified fluent English proficient are our students who filled out the home language survey, were identified as English learners, went through our English language development program and reclassified as fluent English learners. They're doing phenomenally well in language arts, right? That's a success story that our English language development program is working when our reclassified students do so well. Now, if we look at our English learner population, they're not doing as well. Now, one could say, well, that makes sense. They're learning English. Many of these children are first grade, this is grades first through eight. So our kinders aren't included in this data, but these are our first graders. A large percentage of our first graders are in their second year of learning English. So being proficient in an English language arts test is not highly likely. It's normal, we're progressing, right? So in our English learner world, we're monitoring two things. 
how am I doing the content grade level and how am I progressing in becoming proficient in English because they both have to happen and they will meet as we see with our reclassified fluent students, but it may take longer than our students who walked in the door fluent in English, right? So that's our language arts data. Um, in this, and I'm sorry, my screen, because I'm screen sharing, you can't see this, but what we're working on for our staff is our teachers are doing intensive iReady training with our, the same Amanda who presented the parent workshops yesterday. She's working with our teachers too, to help them become really proficient in assigning the lessons in my path and monitoring student progress. And our e-alerts are paired with them to make sure that we're always focused on how is this working for our English learner students? Because iReady was not developed for English learners, it was developed for fluent English students. So we have to make sure that we're always adding that extra support for our English learners. And that's where the e-alerts come in. Similarly, in math, we're doing the same work. <laughs> now, in the math data, our initial fluent uh, students and our reclassified students are doing better than others, but we'll all agree our math scores are not fantastic, right? There's a lot of work to be done here. And we're hopeful that our December data is going to show significant increases in our students' progression. Uh, and again, our e-alerts are pairing with the teachers. This first semester, they've been focused on language arts. Starting in January, they'll be focused on the math. And again, e-alerts are paired with the math TOSAs to make sure that we always have English learners in mind as we're working through the math that was developed for fluent English students, right? To make sure we have both. What I presented to the board and what I wanted to make sure everyone understands is that English learners are a very diverse group. They don't all look the same. Right? They come from many different countries, they have many different backgrounds, and we have many different um, experiences. But I jumped ahead, I just want to make sure that I share <laughs> this slide on just the my path. That is the work. And again, you saw that if you attended the parent workshops yesterday, and Amanda walked you through what does my path look like? What does it look like for your child? How do you support? And I think if I heard nothing else last night, she said, don't intervene, support and celebrate right? The, the diagnostics intentionally ask your kids questions that are too hard. They intentionally ask questions that are too easy. And they intentionally ask questions that are just right to get a sense of where your child's performance level really is. And then the my path helps them work right there. So if they come to you and say, mommy, I couldn't answer any questions. You say, you know what? The test is just seeing where you are. You're a first grader. They asked you some eighth grade questions and they asked you some kindergarten questions and they're trying to get it just right. So just trust in the process and keep working at it, right? And our goal is just to give them the time and the space to practice those exercises, right? And hopefully we'll see in December when you get a progress report that your child is improving. And if not, now you know questions to ask the teacher to ask for help. So back to our English learners, or uh, a term that is a better descriptor is our multilingual learners, because calling a child an English learner implies that they're missing something. They're learning English because they're already proficient in another language or more. Some of our children speak two and three and four other languages. English is just another one. I remember we said being bilingual is a superpower. As we see with our reclassified students, the more languages you know, actually the better you achieve. You see connections across languages. It simulates parts of your brain that really are important for success in life. So we, we would like to see all of our children bilingual, multilingual. I, I, I'm in awe of some of our families and parents who come in and say, well, this is just my sixth language. You know, we used to think that having two was really cool, okay? But if you can speak three and four and five, you've really got it, right? So that's what we're aiming for for all of our kids. But when we look, because when we looked at the data, you saw that our English learners were, were 
progressing at a much lower rate than our reclassified English learners and our initially fluent English learners. This helps explain a little bit of that. If you look at our data, 146 of our students are newcomers. That means they have been in our country less than three years. And they are just now learning how does school work? How does English work? Some of them have interrupted schooling. Some of them have come from really challenging circumstances. That's one pot of our English learner population. The vast majority of our English learners have been with us one to five years learning English. Uh, if you remember, the research shows that in order to master a new language, it takes anywhere from four to seven years. Okay, it doesn't happen overnight. Some, some kids are really good at it and they will master it and reclassify in two years and they blow us away. But most of us takes some time. <laughs> so if it's gonna take me five years to master English, I'm not gonna demonstrate proficiency on my iReady English and math right away. So that makes sense. Then we have another group, about 160 of our students who have been with us for six years or more, and they have not reclassified. And so we need to do some more intensive work with them, more intensive supports, because either they're that child that needs that seventh year. So ooh, sixth grade, suddenly they're going to crest over the wave and boom, they're going to reclassify. Or there was something that got missed because English wasn't quite grasped and content just kept going on when they were younger. So we need to do more intensive supports. So what are we doing? So for our newcomers, we have a newcomer ELD class. Uh, this is the curriculum, it's called Get Ready. And it helps our students with basic vocabulary. This is math in English. This is what science sounds like in English. This is how we get around a school in English. This is how we ask for what we need in English. It's a very targeted program. <clears throat> we offer it at the middle school in their designated ELD class. All newcomers, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade are together one period a day working through this curriculum. And when they reach a certain uh, level of proficiency, they move to the intermediate ELD class. At the elementary schools, we use this in small groups uh, during ELD time. And there are also newcomer support groups before and after school, building community, building friendships, uh, helping them understand how the school system works. We also, if you haven't heard, have a brand new ELD curriculum for all our English learners. It's called Benchmark Express. Uh, the teachers have been working with it just since September when school started. It's better than the ELD program we had before. It's aligned with the LPAC task types and it has interim progress monitoring. Uh, so that the teachers can assess the students and give you feedback on how they're progressing in their English language proficiency. So it's a big improvement. It's just one more new thing the teachers are grappling with along with iReady and that. So we're all learning together. Uh, we also have phonics intervention, particularly at the middle school level. Uh, and our middle school teachers, our English language arts and English language development teachers are going through a uh, full year training on getting reading right. Because our secondary teachers were not trained in how to teach reading. Secondary teachers expect that when a sixth grader arrives, they can read. They're not prepared for a sixth grader who reads at a second grade level. So we are doing intensive work with our teachers to give them strategies and approaches to help our students who are in their classes in seventh grade science and eighth grade math who are reading at a second grade level. How do we support them to help them move forward? So that's another layer of work that we're doing to support our kids. We also, as you know, we have our e-alerts at every school site and they are coaching our teachers they're following the data, following, going to the classes where most of the English learners are and coaching those teachers through, helping those kids move forward in their English language development. So there's a lot happening on the academic side. 
And some of the way that we monitor it, this is an example. This is a third grade example. It's an LPAC task type where the children have to write about academic information. And so they read a little story about um, animals in uh, the water. And then as you can see here, progress monitoring assessment one to progress monitoring assessment two, the increase in the amount of language being used, the increase in the vocabulary being used. Um, it's very, uh, uh, it makes me happy, right? It makes the teacher happy to see the work I'm doing is having an impact. And so if we progress monitor after every unit, we can see that the children not only are understanding what's coming at them, but they're able to produce it either in speaking or in writing. Uh, that's very good information for us. And they're assessed with that on the LPAC and that's how they demonstrate their proficiency. We also have a lot of social emotional uh, interventions and supports going on for our English learners. Um, we have implemented a new uh, student and family orientation for families. So if I arrive from Nicaragua today and go into the school to register, I'm going to be walked through a discussion with the principal. And then I may be walked over to meet the social worker and the social worker is going to explain to me the resources available. And then I'm going to be handed off to the eLERT who's going to talk to me about English language development and how that's going to support me. And then they're gonna walk me over to the counselor who's going to give me my schedule and take me on a tour and show me where my classes are. And then I'm gonna go see the tech advisor who's going to issue me my Chromebook, help me log in, get me into all of my programs, then I'll be taken to see where the recess yard is, where lunch is, be introduced to school supervision aides. And then I get sent home and say, we'll see you tomorrow. And the, the principal and the team informs all the teachers on the roster, guess what? Juan is starting with you tomorrow. Juan comes from Nicaragua. Here's what we know. How much schooling he's had, interests he might have, areas of need they might have, so that when Juan shows up on the first day of school, everybody's like, hey, Juan, I'm so glad you're here. Welcome, come on in. And we're good to go. As opposed to in the past, oftentimes teachers would open their door. And there's a new kid standing there. They've had no information, no preparation. This is a much warmer and more welcoming way to bring our kids in and help them feel successful from their very first day. We also do uh, advisory sessions for the newcomer kids with our social workers. Again, building friendships, helping them understand how school works. We have newcomer support groups before and after school for our kids. We're doing parent meetings with our newcomer students um, about whatever topics may need to be discussed to help parents feel more comfortable. Just like we have adult ESL classes, we introduce our families to that so they can get resources for themselves. Um, so there's a lot happening to support our English learners to ensure that they are progressing as they should. And I hope you are observing this at your site. And if you haven't seen it, feel free to ask about it. I'd love to know how are we supporting our newcomers or hey, I would love to be that parent that you assign to greet newcomer families. I would love, you know, that would be a wonderful thing for our volunteers to get involved in because you know, I can invite you all day long, but you don't care. If my let invites you, you'll come, right? Because there's a friend, there's a buddy at school that you know, it's different. So if we make those partnerships, it really helps our families. So that's enough from me. What I wanted to do now is to hear from you about what's helping or happening in your ELAX at school, what questions you might have, and as I was preparing this, I just wanted to share this with you because I found this, um, my computer doesn't trust me. Um, no matter how long you're in it, it it'll drop you. But I found this um, video, we made these videos, how long ago was it, my life? Two years ago, three years ago? Four. But I wanted you to hear. Four. 
Los estudiantes aprendices de inglés tienen derecho a programas y servicios educativos. Los padres somos socios y necesitamos estar informados sobre estos programas y servicios. Nuestra voz importa. Mylette, you want to tell us a little bit about our history of video making? Well, back then we were a big community of um, volunteers and this room was filled with parents that uh, wanted to make an impact in our students' academic And um, Miss Julie started this committee and one of the parents from Anderson was elected back then. Mm -hmm. And she passed on um, the position to us. And Miss Julie said, how can we spread the word? And we came up with ideas of having each school record a video uh, of what ELA is and what it does. Because even now, you ask him how your ELAC looks like at, at your school sites. For Anderson, this first meeting was only me showing up. Hmm. So probably there is some misunderstanding of what ELAC is and what it does for the students that are learning English and for for the whole school community because if the English learners, it's a it's a big group. If they grow academically, the whole community, the whole school community will benefit from that. And that's how the video came about. Having a voice like in the video says that Miss Julie gave us a school. Having each school site and probably each school site has one video like this with the parents that were mm -hmm. part of the committee back then. I'll find them. I'll find my Let's version. I'll find. <laughs> I know Adams did one. I know Twain did yeah, one. Green. Green did, yeah, yeah. So they're they're out there, and I I think we're at a point where we need to do it again. Yes. We need to get. And again, it's it can't be me. It can't. It has to be you. They have to see you. You're the one that's at the pickup line with them. They're at the drop off line with you at the PTA meeting at the the winter concert, whatever. They need to hear from other parents that this matters and what you're learning and what you're doing uh, to support our kids. But I know Twain is here. Anderson is here. Mitchell's in the, in the stratosphere. I'm not sure who else. Oh, yes. <laughs> well, yeah, you're Mitchell and Carson and yeah, you're all of it. Um, what's happening at your sites currently? Oh, hi, good morning. Uh, my name is Tania, and I am a ELAC uh, member from North Queens. Um, in our last meeting, we were seeing the statistics of how the English uh, speaker learners uh, did uh, from 2021, 2022, 2023, 20, 20, 20, and now 2023, 20, 24. And uh, we were very happy to see that um, kids are uh, reclassifying it. Um, almost 75% of the kids. Um, so the statistics look really good. I think we're doing our job. But we are always looking, we're always listening to parents of what do they need and how we could support the students um, to do better. Um, so we also, like you said, we want the school to be more aware of who we are as ELAC uh, members. So we were planning on probably making a little posters or banners whenever we have our meeting, maybe uh, having uh, the members of teachers so that parents could be free to ask us any questions uh, because Small parents are aware of who we are, but it's not, I think it's not good enough. We want mm -hmm. really, really for everybody to know what that means uh, so that we could 
have the feelings that are every day. Great. So you're working on it. I remember one word that you used years ago. It was not an English learner. It's a, a an emerging a, bilingual. I like that. Hmm. We were talking with our uh, with Miss Gill and um, Anderson that probably having an ELEP meeting. They're like, what is that? And hmm. The acronym it doesn't click right. And when you said English learner, also it's like. Oh no, my my student speaks fluent English. Mm. Probably it's also the the misconception of English learning. But I like mm -hmm. the emerging bilinguals yes. or multilingual learners. So calling the parents having all the words attached to it, and you you said it in the uh, statistics. Uh, when they speak more than one language, mm -hmm. they're doing much better academically. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So there is a benefit. Yeah. It. So uh, that's one of the things, like you said, brainstorming ideas of how to bring parents at what one to change the title instead mm -hmm. of ELAC meetings, having words that can connect with the, with the parents mm -hmm. and they will be willing to come and, and to know what what is this mm -hmm. thank you this is a great info because um we're not uh, so we are still brainstorming it in our banner or poster so it will be probably that and then using these words like emerging uh, learners multilingual mm -hmm. uh, students and you know probably like I don't know something to motivate students and the parents to be like oh my gosh uh we can you know, I want to reclassify because a lot of parents I notice that they don't know what it is to reclassify. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh no, we speak English. Like, you know, my I have a parent that he, she told me, oh well, I speak Spanish, but my husband speaks English, so my my child she speaks English too, and she barely speaks Spanish. Nonetheless, she's in the uh, in the program, and mm -hmm. she's like, I cannot understand what's going on. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, had to explain her, like, you know, how it works. And she was a little frustrated because she said, well, I didn't approve for my child to be in this program. I really don't want to go through this thing of reclassifying. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, um, but I told her it would be nice if you can join us. So you could see if your child actually is or not in, you know, the uh, ELAN, you know, and if she did Let's figure it out together the way mm -hmm. to reclassify. It's, it's, we're not talking about if people speak or not English. We're talking about how confident and how you know how, how much she knows in order for her, her to be successful mm -hmm. when she goes to middle school. So thank you. We were also thinking of people that we could say. <laughs> Maybe you want to film your own little video. I mean, come on. How many of you have seen your kids doing it? <laughs> Look at me. Here's my friends. We're at ELAC. Click, put it in, you know. You put it on your social media feed or you send it out through Parent Square. I mean, we're all a little shy, but I mean, look at how you reacted to, to her speaking to you. It means something that she's the one telling you. It's important, right? Your voice matters. Come. We want you there. A little, sometimes, you know, we are all busy. We're making dinner, but I can, I can look at a two minute video on my phone while I'm making dinner right? Oh, maybe I will. Oh, I've seen her at the parking lot. Oh, maybe I'll go. Right. I think it's, it's could be helpful. Faces are helpful, right? So if, if you don't want, if you're too shy to make a video right now, maybe you just put up your pictures, come join us, <laughs> right? Come see us. Um, a few minutes ago, the interpreter sent a message that he's having a hard time hearing. He, he hears you, correct? Okay. Because you're right, right there. Mm -hmm. Louder. Oh, Thank oh, you. Yeah. Thank you. I'll do this if you squeeze it. Thank you. Or I'll make you come stand right here. So I, I do have a question. When you said um, I ready in design for English speaking, speaking students, um, so what does that mean? Uh, so how or when is the program gonna add more support like 
phonetics or grammar exercises in the app for the students, right? How are we mm -hmm. gonna, if it was designed for uh, English speakers and not English learners, how, how are we gonna support more English learners? I think that, you know, um, like the phonetics mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Well, and that's where the teacher comes in. And if you remember, Amanda pointed out, this is a small part of the instruction, right? The teacher is the one who has to onboard your child to be successful. The teacher can assign lessons outside of my path. The teacher can do uh, group, small group lessons. Let's use an example, right? In Spanish, a es a es a forever, right? A, there's no other sound. In English, a can be a, a, uh, 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 I mean, it comes in a whole different variety of sounds. I ready is not preparing your English learner to know the difference. It's just going to work us through the phonics and your child might come home and go, oh my God, this one letter, mom, it has like 15 different sounds. What's happening in our language? It's one. Unless it's paired with, you know, a, e, a comes together, right? But a siempre es a, right? So it's a lot to learn. And so the teacher has to frame it. Like, hey, boys and girls, guess what? In Spanish, one sound only. In English, it can have a lot of different sounds. So today we're going to focus on this sound that the letter A makes and why it sounds this way when it is paired with this letter in front of it or this letter behind it. And as I always told my students, English is weird. English is a mixture of a whole bunch of other languages. We have stolen from the French. We have stolen from Spanish. We have stolen from Italian. We have stolen from German. Our rules make no sense, right? So I'm here as your guide to help you understand where we see commonalities. And then here's English, totally different. And so that's on the teacher that we build into our, that English language development program, that's where that happens. And that's why when parents say, it's okay, you know, we speak English enough. It's like, yes, you might speak English, but I'm talking about academic English and how to help your child read an eighth grade science text is very different than talking with his friends on the playground. And if we don't give him the tools He's going to be talking with his friends on the playground and failing science. And that's not what we want. We want your child to be successful all the way through. So we have to provide the supports and the on-ramps. One thing that iReady does provide is it does have Spanish instruction. So if we get a newcomer, my friend Juan from my earlier example, just arrived from Nicaragua. I may do his initial iReady assessment in Spanish because I want to know what Juan knows. If I test him in English, I can't understand what he knows because he can't tell me. He can't show me because he doesn't understand the vocabulary, but he can show me in Spanish so I know where he is and then I can help him make the transition to English. I might decide to give him his my path in Spanish for the first semester so that he can attend class in English, but get that support in my path in the language he understands better while I'm helping him bridge that vocabulary. But I'm the teacher, I provide that. I already will never provide that support. That's why you, the teacher is such an important component in this and the English language development is so important. It has to go together. So any of us who are worried about computers taking over the world, I can't. You still need the human. The human has to provide that bridge. So our teachers are very important, which is why they're getting training in all this iReady as well to make sure that they know what's available and where they can add resources for the kids who need it. I hope that answered your question. Yes. Okay. More questions, Sure. So it's related to that. When it comes to reports, you know, uh, this first parent teacher conference, we were given the I ready report along with our progress report. Um, well, not the progress report, but 
what we did from um, the parents and the teachers. Mm -hmm. um, will you say that for English learners, the I rating will be in a lower score because they are not assessed necessarily in their level? Your child is an individual. Your child will score where he or she scores. Some English learners are going to be delayed and they're not going to score as high. Some learn like that and they're going to do just fine. So it really depends on your individual student, but the assessment is going to start out. Your daughter, is in, your son is in fifth grade, right? He's gonna give him some fifth grade questions, some sixth grade questions, some fourth grade questions, some eighth grade questions, some second grade questions, more fifth grade questions, and really get a sense of where he is and hone in. If your son is an English learner, what he knows might be masked by language. And that's why we have to make sure we're providing the language support because he may know a lot more than he's able to show on the iReady because that language barrier is there. So we're, we're doing both at the same time to pull the barrier away so he can show what he knows. Does that, did I answer? So I remember before it used to be the benchmark, right? Mm -hmm. The benchmark is you no know, kind of one, two, three, four. Mm -hmm. uh, is this similar to the I already? Uh, is, is it somehow matching? Well, smart? they're or similar they in that they're both aligned with grade level standards, but benchmarks assessments are aligned to the unit of study. So if we're studying government and democracy in our benchmark unit, the stories are going to be about democracy. And, and so it's really seeing if they understood the content being taught as well as the grammar and the language. iReady is independent of that content and it's just looking at fifth grade reading standards. Can you tackle a fifth grade text and understand it and answer the questions correctly? So yes and no. both give us different information and they're both valuable about how our child is progressing. One last question. So yesterday, um, the, Anna was there at the I ready and is she be able to ask the teacher for the report? Mm -hmm. She remembers seeing the paper, but she didn't know what it was. Mm. And uh, I mentioned to her that she can't ask for a copy. Is that possible? Yes. Yeah, yeah. I think now you might want to wait for the January because then you'll have two data points because the, the report is from September and they've been working, working, working. Now it's December. So I think the December report is going to be much more valuable to you because you'll see the growth. Right. And so you have, I think, report cards are coming out next week. Right. And then your children will take that assessment. And then in January, we'll have the results. That would be, I mean, yes, of course, you can ask for the old one. But I think the more valuable one will be the January, where you see the growth pattern of where your child is. But yes, your teachers can get that for you. I missed the training yesterday. They already have that recorded on the Wario website, right? We've asked for it. It's proprietary to iReady, but Amanda, who presented, was asking if she could share the recording with us. So I'm following up with her. If not, I'll invite her to do another one. Because on the kids' Chromebook, if you log on to their iReady, you can see what scores they got. Mm. So, I mean, it's it's gonna have like all of their scores, like assignments or like, you know, little games and stuff mm -hmm. that they play. But at least you can kind of see what your students have mm -hmm. also. And she did introduce you all to the family resource webpage where you can get a lot of information. Now, if that's too much to wade through alone, you could always ask for a workshop from your language arts specialist or your math TOSA or your eLERT say, hey, would you mind? Could we bring a group of parents together and could we really dig into it? They'd be happy to. So don't feel like you have to wade through that all by yourself. 
you have resources to help you. So I know we're running low on time, but we heard questions at least and some update from Twain, some questions from Anderson. Mitchell's in the room. What's happening with your ELAC? Uh, Miss Eliana, I think your ears are burning. I think you just got a compliment. <laughs> well, that's great. That's great news. And I hope um, if our other sites here are represented that you are also having meetings where you are getting turnout. I know Green was so excited. Green had their first ELAC meeting and they had nine parents show up uh, in November. Uh, last year, it was typically they had their one, their president was there every time, but they had a hard time getting parents. They got nine. And one of the things we're learning um, both through our, uh, our APAC committees, our DLAC, ELAC, SSE, the power of the personal connection, a phone call beforehand, calling your families, hey, we're having a meeting, we'd really like to see you. That makes a difference. Or your pictures or your videos, as we see here, anything you can do to get them in. Uh, and also looking to see, you know, does your meeting time work? Does in-person work? Is Zoom better? It depends. As an example, yesterday we had 13 parents show up at Rogers in person for iReady. We had 39 online last night. Clearly the nighttime was better for most of our families. I'll admit I was watching and chopping vegetables. I was making dinner, but I could watch while I was doing that. It's hard to be away from home, but I could still benefit from listening. So we're trying to offer it in as many ways and times as possible. So that's something to consider with your groups too. When does it work for you? Because it's hard. And speaking of time, we're over time. So I'm going to just scoot forward. If I can make this move. Just to remind you of the progress we've made. Um, we've been working through these things. One of the things uh, that was asked for prior was more music to help our children understand. Sharice Jones, our e-alert at uh, Twain was kind enough to share this document, which I will share out with all of you, but it goes through all the different songs that are available for each unit. It shows you how to play them, how to access them. And there's not a ton, but let's say there's five per grade level, but it's something so that you can see how it works. And just for an example, like for Spanish, this is a, um, I have them in English and in Spanish. They also, you can download the lyrics. So you have them. So there are resources and you can access them through class link where your student can access. So those are there for you. Uh, other updates. So we talked about communication. Many of you participated in our Parent Square trainings. I hope they were helpful. I think it's a start. I know we didn't have huge turnout, but I'm hoping little by little, we're getting more parents involved. Uh, one of the things that had been asked for is a venue for our parents to share their skills and occupations from their prior lives that they could share with the community. Uh, when our wellness center opens, it looks like it will be January now. That's on the docket for an event because we know we have secret talents. We have secret nurses and EMTs and teachers and librarians and such who have skills to share who might want to volunteer their time. And speaking of which, we have our Spanish for parents who want to learn Spanish classes, hopefully beginning in January, courtesy of Brenda, 
our teacher. Um, and just so we did a survey. Now, this was targeted towards the children in the dual immersion program. So you can see why Twain would have a lot because we have a lot of kids in dual immersion. It's not limited to parents of kids in dual immersion, but we wanted to get a sense. We asked them their level of proficiency. Most would be beginning uh, the format they would prefer. They would like a mix. They want some in person and some virtual. Uh, it looks like the winner Fridays in the morning, uh, but there are some other opportunities there. Um, they'd like to meet weekly. I don't know if we're up for that necessarily, but we're going to try, right? So we're making progress on our goals to help everyone who needs to learn English, learn English. Anyone who wants to learn Spanish, learn Spanish, and to help all of our parents succeed. And these are our next meetings. So this has been a very busy week of parent meetings. We have APAC coming up tomorrow, DPACs in December, and then our team DLAC returns in January. And by then, hopefully we'll have both data sets for iReady so we can look and see how our English learners have progressed. In the meantime, what's your job? Go back and do the same at your school sites, right? Make your videos or your posters or your visits at the drop off and pick up pick up lines, invite other families to join. And I will send you the family toolkits, the parents of refugee student resources. So you have them on site. And last comments for the group. Anyone in the virtual world? We're good. All right. Thank you, everybody. Happy holidays. Thank you for all that you do. We'll see you soon. We'll see you this group in January. Thank you. You know.